deeply wounded by people or forces beyond our control. When a blow has come just from nowhere, so it seems, a blow that permanently changes our lives, how do we heal from that? Do we heal according to some schedule or plan? Or do we plunge into the unknown? Do we seek out the ancient powers of the earth? I'm Jay Leeming, and this is the Crane Bag Podcast. Today we're going to explore the story called The Handless Maiden, a Grimm's fairy tale that is in fact found in over a hundred versions around the world. I'm going to be joined in exploring this story by my friend Elaine Stanton, who has a lot of experience with stories. Thank you for being here. Let us begin. Right. Welcome to the Crane Bag Podcast. And today we're going to explore, as I said, a story called The Handless Maiden. And I should say right away that this is a pretty brutal story. It's a violent story. But the violence in it is not arbitrary, but actually has meaning and is dealt with in a beautiful and very real way. So I'm just letting you know that. So prepare yourselves. It's not fuzzy, happy bunny rabbits uh, on this, in this story. And um, it's nothing like anything you will see in a movie house or on any movie. It's much less violent than anything like that. But uh, nonetheless, it is a pretty brutal story in its, in its ways. Um, and I love that these fairy tales go there, actually, and deal with these hard things. As I said, this story has over a hundred different versions around the world. Um, many versions told and kept alive by women telling the story. It's a story which, in some respects, speaks to that feminine part of ourselves, uh, whatever our gender speaks to that feminine side of ourselves. And uh, a, a story can be like a forest, and you walk through it and you notice things. And if you're there with other people, they might notice other things. One person notices a rock on the ground. Someone else notices the leaves of the trees. Someone else hears a distant bird that no one else noticed. So uh, today I'm joined by my friend Elaine Stanton, who has spent many years exploring stories. And I'm hoping we can go through this story together and uh, uh, deal with its uh, beautiful difficulty. Uh, thank you for being here, Elaine. Great to be here, Jay. And I'm very excited about the story and we will wander through it together. Thank you. I'm reassured. Um, perhaps you could tell me and the folks listening uh, how your relationship with story began. Okay. Um, I love fairy tales. And uh, at an early age, I was interested in Jungian psychology. And I, I eventually got a PhD in a program that specialized in that. And, and, and we studied fairy tales there. And, but you know, having that background is all uh, good. It is background. In the end, these stories just come alive and it's so great you are telling them. And we can just sit back and be receptive and let these images flow through us because they are old and ancient and they have a lot of meaning today. So I'm very excited about it. Cool, cool. Well, I'm glad to have you here. And I just want to mention, you do have some um, experience therapeutically with, with story. With yes. Like, yes. Yes. I, so I, I have a PhD and, and uh, practice as a child psychologist. Mm. I specialize with children, especially. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you don't have to have a PhD to really love story <laughs> right oh of course of course sometimes it helps not to you know yes but, uh... exactly my point right <laughs> but uh and, and let me say we're not going to look at this story as therapeutic you know mm -hmm. we are just going to have it come alive for us in our lives yes yes so, okay I 
Wonderful, wonderful. Well, yeah. thank you for being here. So without further ado, let us begin the story of The Handless Maiden. Once there was a miller who did not work as a miller anymore. He still lived in the mill with his wife and with his daughter. But the river, which had turned the mill wheel for so many years, well, it was filled with sand, and that mill wheel no longer turned. And the grinding stones inside that mill, they no longer turned either. And no one brought their grain to that mill to grind it into flour. So the miller earned his living in a different way, by walking into the forest with an axe and chopping down wood and selling it in the market in the nearby village. So one spring day he set out, as he often did, into that forest. But as he did so, suddenly, from out behind an old tree, there stepped a gray man. What are you going to cut with that axe, the gray man said. Oh, just some wood to sell in the market, that's all. That's how you earn your living, is it, said the gray man. What if I told you? You could make a deal with me, and after that deal was made, you wouldn't have to work any more. You wouldn't have to struggle and search for your living in this world. No, no, you would be a wealthy man. I'd say you were dreaming, said the miller. But what sort of agreement are you suggesting? Well, said the gray man, I live in these woods here, you know. I've learned many things. I'm something of a magician, you might say. And I have secret powers. So I would say all you would have to do is agree to give me something. Let's say, oh, let's say what's behind your house. Yeah, just give me what is behind your house. Promise me that. And I will make a deal between you and the spirits of this world so that you will never have to work again. What do you say? The miller thought about this. What was behind his house? Well, there was a flowering apple tree there now. It was spring, and the apple tree was very beautiful. He thought about chopping that tree up and delivering it to the gray man. Well, we can always plant another apple tree, he thought. So he looked at the gray man and he said, Oh, why not? Yes, I'll give you whatever is behind my house. Sure, that's no problem. I agree to that. And the gray man smiled and said, Wonderful. I will come in three years to take what is mine. Three years, said the miller. Yes, three years. Until then, enjoy your wealth. And the gray man turned and he walked off into the forest. The miller watched him go. And after a while, he couldn't see him anymore. And the miller turned with his axe in his hand, and he walked back towards the mill. As he approached it, he saw his wife hanging up laundry on a line outside. My husband, she said, where did you get the gold? The gold, he said. Yes, the gold. There's a chest of gold pieces in the front room. That's not ours, is it? Uh, it is ours, he said. I, I made an agreement with a, um, a man, a sort of a magician in the woods. What? A magician in the woods? What sort of agreement, my husband? Well, I, I agreed to give him whatever is behind our house. All that's there is that apple tree, and we can surely plant another. Oh, my husband, she said. There's more than the apple tree there. Our daughter is there, sweeping the yard as she always does. Have you given away our daughter? I, I don't know, he said. What have you done, she said. And she went towards him, and she grabbed hold of him as if to beat him or hit him in some way. And then she just began to sob. And she pressed her head against his chest. And she said, My husband, I'm tired of struggling. I'm tired too, he said. I'm tired. And then the two of them walked towards the mill. And they walked into the kitchen, and they looked through the kitchen window and out into the other side of the house. And there was the flowering apple tree, and beneath it was their daughter, sweeping the yard and singing to herself. And right then and there, without speaking about it, the two of them agreed never to tell her anything 
about the agreement, and they also agreed not to spend any of the gold coins. So the miller went to the front room, and there was indeed a large wooden chest filled with gold coins there. And he took it. It was heavy, but he heaved it into a closet, and he closed the door. And then his wife opened the kitchen window and called to their daughter. And their daughter came laughing into the kitchen, and they all had lunch. Well, time went on after that. The mill wheel didn't turn, but the wheel of the year did turn. And spring became summer, and summer became autumn. And who knows when it started? Who knows when they started spending the gold coins? Perhaps it was when the miller needed some new wool socks. Perhaps it was when his wife needed a new dress. But after a while, he had those wool socks, and she had that new dress. And their daughter noticed these things and asked, Mother, Father, where do these new things come from? And they looked at her and just said, My dear, we've been lucky. Your parents have been lucky. So slowly they began to spend that money. The shed needed a new roof, so it got a new roof. Their daughter had a birthday. She needed a cake. Why bake a cake when you can buy one at the market? So slowly they began to spend those gold coins. The months went by, the seasons went by, they became years. One year, two years, three years went by. And in the spring of that year, the miller found himself walking home from the market. And as he walked, there was the jingle of gold coins in his pocket. Once it had been the trickling of the river which had comforted him. But now it was the sound of those gold coins. And as he came to a crossroads, there was a shed there, an old broken down shed. And out from behind it, there stepped the gray man. The miller went cold inside when he saw him. And the gray man said, Miller! What are you up to today? Been to the market, I see. Yes, he said, I've, I've been to the market. Well, I like to buy and sell things too. I like to make deals, and I've made a deal with you. Don't forget that. I will come to your house in three days to take what is mine. See that she is prepared. I, I will, he said. And the gray man turned and went behind the shed, and then he was gone. The miller stood there in the road for a moment, with a deep, cold feeling in his belly, and then he walked back home. And he got to their kitchen, and he put the groceries he had bought at the market on the counter. His wife was there at the sink, and he looked out the window at the flowering apple tree, and he said, I met the gray man on the road. He says he'll be here in three days. Oh, my husband, she said. And she wept and she embraced him. Their daughter was out in the yard beneath the apple tree. And then the two of them left the groceries there on the counter and went out into the yard. And they spoke to their daughter. And they told her about the gold coins in the chest. And about where all the new things had come from. And about the agreement the miller had made with the gray man. And the miller said, so, my dear, I made this agreement, but there must be a way out, yes. And his wife spoke and said, Yes, my dear, we will find a way out. Your father didn't know you were back there. He just thought he was giving away the apple tree. He didn't know you would be there. This deal is not fair. And their daughter looked at the two of them and said, Mother, father, you made an agreement, and agreements must be kept. No, no, my child, her mother said. No, no, we will do this. Tonight you will bathe and wash yourself very clean. And then we will put you in a white dress. And you will sleep, you will sleep uh, in the kitchen, on the floor there. And I will make, I'll get all the salt in the house and I'll make a circle of salt around you. For I have heard that such measures can keep away evil magic. Let us try that. Well, their daughter nodded and agreed. And so that night... Their daughter bathed herself, and she put on a white dress. And she slept not in her bed, but on the floor of the kitchen, with salt arranged around her in a circle. And the miller slept in a chair with his axe beside him in that kitchen. And his wife slept in the next room. And none of them slept very well. 
But in the morning the birds began to sing, and a new day dawned. Was the gray man there? He was not. All morning long he refused to appear. They began to get bolder. Their daughter would walk away from that circle of salt to get a drink of water, or to walk around in the garden, but always she would return a little nervously to that circle of salt. Then the afternoon came. Still the gray man did not appear. They began to get almost happy, giddy. Perhaps he wouldn't come. The sun was approaching the horizon. If the sun set, perhaps the deal was off. Perhaps it had all been a game, a joke. Perhaps he was not coming. And the miller's wife went to the cupboard, and she took down a jar of old flour. I will bake some bread, she said. I have not baked bread in a long time. And she went to the counter and put the jar down there. And then she looked out the window, and she saw a face. And the face was the gray man, looking in the window at her. And he smiled. And he walked around to the back door, and he opened it, and he said, Miller! I am here to take what is mine. Is she ready? Is she prepared? And he looked, and he saw their daughter there in a white dress in that circle of salt. Miller, are you trying to sneak away to get yourself out of this deal? You made an agreement, sir. It must be kept. But I cannot take her like this, in that white dress, all clean as she is. No, no, she must not bathe for an entire week. She must be dirty from head to toe, and then she will be mine. I will come in seven days to take what is mine. Do not fail in this, or I will take you, sir, and you will never see this world again. And fire flashed in his eyes, and then he turned and walked into the backyard. And a moment later there was only smoke in that yard, blowing away on the breeze. And the miller's wife began to sob. And their daughter stood up, and she said, Father, you made an agreement. Agreements must be kept and she walked out into the backyard. And all that week she did not wash or clean herself in any way. Her hair became tangled and strange. There were sticks and leaves in it. She wore only the one dress, the white dress, which became dark and covered in dirt and in mud. A whole week passed, and finally it was the night before the day when the gray man would come. And in the middle of this night their daughter awoke, and looked out her bedroom window at the apple tree, flowering in the moonlight. And suddenly she was very scared. And she wept and she cried, and those tears fell on her dirty hands and washed them clean. Her sorrow made them clean. And eventually she slept. And then morning came and the birds sang. But the gray man did not arrive. They weren't sure what to do, where to go. All morning they puttered around the house, and then in the afternoon they went out into the garden. A new garden, they'd had it put in very recently by master gardeners from the village. And they drank some lemonade, expensive lemonade, because lemons come from far off. And they waited there in that garden. And just as before, the sun seemed like it would soon go down. It was approaching the horizon. Soon the day would be over. Perhaps the deal would be off. And then there was a sound from inside the house, a scuttling, footsteppy sound. And the miller stood up and opened the kitchen door. Hello? Hello? He said. And then, from the backyard, behind the shed, there came the gray man. And he walked towards all of them. The miller turned. They all looked at him, and he said, Miller, I am here to take what is mine. Is she ready? Is she prepared? And he walked, and he looked at their daughter, looked at her from head to toe. She is not prepared. Look at her. Her hands are clean. I said she must be dirty from head to toe. I cannot take her like this. Miller, you must cut off those hands. What, he said? Cut off her hands? Yes, Miller, I said dirty from head to toe, and her hands are clean. Her sorrow will not save her. Cut off those hands, you must. I will come in seven days to take her then. She must be ready. She must be prepared. Do this, or I will take you and your wife both, and I will ruin this house and this land. And fire flashed in his eyes once again, and he turned, and then there was only smoke there, drifting away on the wind. 
They all stared into that smoke until it was gone. And then their daughter stood up and she said, Father, agreements must be kept. And slowly and resolutely she walked across that garden and towards the shed. And behind that shed there was an old stump that they had used to kill chickens years ago when they had had chickens. And she knelt down next to that stump, and she laid her wrists down on that stump, open to the air. Her mother burst into tears and ran into the house. The miller stood up. My daughter, my dear daughter, and she said, Father, cut off my hands. My dear daughter, Father, agreements must be kept. Cut off my hands. And trembling, the miller walked into the shed. And then the only sound in the yard was the scritch, scritch, scritch of an axe being sharpened. The girl flexed her hands there on the stump. For a moment, they looked like strange animals come from the sea, like they were already no longer a part of her. She clenched her fists and opened them. She looked up at a cloud in the sky. And then the miller stepped out of the shed. As he walked, he carried the axe. He was very conscious of the weight of that axe in his hand and his ability to hold that axe with his hand. He went to the stump. He looked his daughter in the eyes. Cut off my hands, father. And he lifted the axe high and he brought it down twice. And he cried out and his daughter cried out as well. And the stump was covered in blood. And then her mother rushed from the house, carrying sheets that she'd ripped into strips. And they wrapped these around the stumps of her arms. And their daughter collapsed, and they carried her bleeding into the house, and they laid her in a bed there. And eventually the bleeding stopped, and she slept. And night came, but the miller could not sleep. He got up in the dark. And he walked back out to that shed. He walked back out to that stump. And beside that stump, he saw his daughter's two hands, cold now and unmoving. And then he took a shovel, and he lifted them up as you might lift up two dead rats. And he carried them into the forest. And he dug a hole there. And with the shovel, he pushed the hands into the hole. He looked at his daughter's hands there in the earth, and then he covered them with dirt, and he tamped that dirt down. And he turned and walked back to the shed in the darkness, lit by the stars, and he put that shovel against the wall of the shed. And he walked back into the house, and he tried to sleep. Well, seven days went by, and over that time, their daughter slept a great deal. And she ate a few things, broth and bread, that her mother brought her. And slowly she recovered. She did not die. And slowly she regained her strength. But once again the night came before the day when the gray man was to arrive. And in the darkness she awoke. And she looked out the window of her bedroom at the flowering apple tree there. And she was very scared once again, and she cried tears which fell onto the stumps of her arms and washed those stumps clean. She wept and cried, and finally she slept. And the next morning the birds sang, and the miller awoke and his wife awoke. Where was their daughter? They looked around. She was not in the house. Where has she gone? said the miller. Where has she gone? She hasn't. She, she hasn't. And he went out into the yard, and he looked, and there beside the shed, on the stump covered in dried blood, his daughter was sitting, cradling the stumps of her arms there in her lap. And she was looking off into the distance. She sat there all morning. The miller went to her. He offered her some bread. Father, you made an agreement. Agreements must be kept. Yes, my child. All afternoon she sat there. The miller went and stood by the shed. And finally, when the sun was about to go down, out from behind the shed there came the gray man. Miller, I am here. 
Is she ready? Is she prepared? Is she mine? And he looked at the miller's daughter, and he saw that indeed she was dirty from head to toe, and he saw that she had no hands, but he saw that the stumps of her arms were clean. She has cleaned her arms again. I wanted her dirty from head to toe, Miller. You have been trying to sneak out of this agreement. Well, and sneak out of it you have, for I can only come three times. So I cannot claim her any more. She is yours. But, Miller, you have done well. You have done good work here. You have done my work. Enjoy your wealth, sir. And he turned and he walked off into the forest, and soon there was only smoke where he was, and he was not there. The miller's wife had been watching from the kitchen door. She came running forward, and then she and her husband knelt before their daughter, who was sitting on the bloody stump. Dear one, dear one, they said, we will care for you. We will build you a palace. We have the gold. We have the money. We will build you a beautiful palace. You can live there in style and luxury for all your days. If you want servants, you will have servants. We will care for you in the best way. And she looked at the two of them, and she said, I do not want wealth. I do not want money. For I have seen what those things lead to. Mother, tie my arms behind me. What? Mother, tie my arms behind me, for I have seen what evil arms and hands can do. Trembling, her mother did that. She took some rags nearby, and she tied her daughter's arms behind her. And the young woman said, Mother, father, I will beg and wander through this world. Perhaps I will see you again. And she stood up, and she began to walk away from the stump away from the shed. No, the miller said, no, stay. But their daughter said nothing. She just walked into the forest. And then the miller's wife burst into tears. And the two of them embraced, and they were sad for a long, long time. And the maiden without hands, she walked where there was no path. She walked into the dark places of this world the tangled, shadowy places. She became thin and even dirtier than she had been before. Her hair was covered in mud and sticks. It was long and tangled. She ate ferns. She ate the leaves of trees. She ate a few old blackberries she found on a bush. She scavenged for her living, became very thin, barely alive, it seemed. She wandered for a long, long time, always hungry, always thirsty not sure where she was going, not sure where she should go. Finally, on one moonlit night, she was wandering, stumbling through a dark forest when she heard water nearby. And she went to that water, and she saw there was a moat there. And on the other side of that moat, there was a stone wall. And above that stone wall, she could see pears on the branches of pear trees. Even here across the moat, she could smell that beautiful flavor carried to her on the air. She did not think, ponder, or plan. She simply jumped into the moat. And she squirmed and kicked like a fish, for her arms were still bound behind her. And she oozed and squirmed her way across that water and onto the muddy bank on the other side. Like a slug, she worked her way with her hips and her shoulders up that bank. And then she stood beside the stone wall. It was a tall wall. There was no way she could climb over it. But she was accustomed to looking down. So she looked down and she saw, walking along the wall, she saw a small hole made by a raccoon or a groundhog. Now she was very thin. So she got down on the ground. She stuck her head into that hole. She stuffed her shoulders into that muddy hole and squirmed her way forward, driving herself forward with her feet and her legs. She squirmed like a snake, like a snail or a slug through that hole and out to the other side and the clean grass of the garden. She oozed herself up into that garden and stood up beside the stone wall. 
She swayed in the moonlight and staggered forward towards one of the pear trees. But the pears on those branches were too high for her to reach. She reached up, she stretched, she craned her head upwards, but she could not reach them. And then a kind wind blew, and one of the boughs came down, and one of the pears brushed her cheek with its softness. And she turned her mouth, she snapped at it like a horse, and she got a bite out of that pear, and the juice trickled down her chin. And she snapped at it again, and soon she took hold of that entire pear, and she devoured that pear into her mouth, and it was sweet and juicy, and she felt ecstatic inside. And then she turned and swayed and stumbled away and went to the stone wall, and went down to the ground and squirmed through that raccoony, muddy hole there to the other side, and flopped down the bank and into the moat, and splashed across into the forest on the other side. And she crept into that forest, and she slept. And in the garden, lit by moonlight, there was a puff of smoke. But this smoke came from the pipe of a gardener, who was awake in the night. He had been unable to sleep. He was sitting beside his gardener's hut there, and he had seen everything. And he did not panic, he did not shout or get excited. But he saw everything and then went inside to sleep. Well, morning came and birds sang in the trees. And the king, for this garden was connected to a palace, and that palace was in a kingdom, and that kingdom had a king. The king came from the palace and walked as he always did through that garden. But he noticed as he walked that there was a pear missing from one of the trees. He went to the gardener. Gardener, there's a pear missing. Yes, your majesty, he said. Last night, a creature came out of the dark. It flopped across the moat. I saw it with my own eyes. It came oozing up from the ground, and it staggered and stumbled to one of these pear trees, and it ate one of the pears. It had long, tangled hair. It had no arms, but it did have feet and legs. It devoured one of the pears and then crumpled itself down against that stone wall and flopped across the moat and went off, crashing through the forest. That is what I saw. That is what I heard. Interesting, said the king. Well, tonight you and I must wait in this garden. We will hide in the bushes and perhaps this creature will come again. So the day passed and night came and they did that. The king and his gardener waited in hiding in the bushes of that garden. And after a while they heard a sound, a rustling in the forest on the other side of the moat. And then they heard a great splash and a grunt as something came squirming across that water, kicking with its legs. And something flopped up the muddy bank and something squirmed its way through a hole at the bottom of the stone wall and then rose up into the garden, a great shape covered in hair with no arms, staggering and swaying through the moonlight towards the pear tree. And then horse-like, this creature snapped at the pears there, and it took hold of one and devoured it and ate it down. And the king stood up, and he took a step towards this being, this creature in the garden. And the king said, You there, are you a creature of this earth, or are you a spirit of the air? And the handless maiden looked at him in the moonlight, and she said, I am a woman of earth, I am a woman of earth, rejected by all the world. And the king took a step forward. He could see her dirty face in the moonlight, and he said, I do not reject you, I accept you. And he walked closer, and she took a step towards him, and she saw him in that moonlight. And then he said, Come, my dear, let's get you cleaned up. And he reached out to take her hand, and then he realized that she had no hands. And he and the gardener led her back through the garden to a door in the side of the palace. And she got inside, and she saw there was a room there, with chairs and a table, with a rug on the floor, with torches in the walls illuminating that room. She was astonished at this sight. It was the most marvelous thing she had ever seen. And then she staggered 
and she fell. And the king caught her, and he and the gardener carried her to a bedroom there. And she slept more soundly and more peacefully in that bed than she had in a long, long time. Thank you for listening to this story. Thank you for attending to it. And thank you, Elaine, for attending to it as well and being here with me as we explore this story. After hearing it, is there a place in the story that you were uh, drawn to uh, in particular? Well, I, I like to just start from the beginning and imagine what it would be like to be each of the characters in the story, mm-hmm. you know? I think um, it's it's not good to just focus on one character because there are aspects of ourself that are all um, the different parts of it. So yeah. I kind of approach it like that. We can all claim parts of ourselves as the, it's easy to see like the Miller as like evil, right? I mean, that would be one reaction, you know? Yes. But then the, then the, um, the more uh, interesting way is to see perhaps part of part of us all is like that, that poor Miller trying to pay the bills there and all that, perhaps. Um, right. Working yeah. hard, you Work- know, mm-hmm. and just working so hard that he's ignoring other aspects of his life, his self, others. Mm-hmm. We all get like that at times, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. And the thing about the Miller is he wants to make a deal to get ahead the easy way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we all are, are attracted to that as well. <laughs> yeah, right. We make deals to get ahead the easy way, right? Mm-hmm. With the credit card company, with whoever it is, I suppose. Yes. Yeah. That seems like a basic need in a lot of these fairy tales is just how to survive and how to survive uh, in luxury would be the dream or without working. You know, he wants to not work, I guess, right? In a way he wants to. Well, or I look at it and that is one way to see it as just actually missing the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. He's so focused on making more money Mm -hmm. that he does, he's not aware of what he's actually doing, you know? even in the fairy tales where the the brothers go out and they don't feed the animals uh, that that the youngest uh, sibling does, that sibling is actually being practical and thinking of the bigger picture, which includes the instinctual, it includes life, it includes nature, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And so this is the, the Miller's that part of us that's just focused on one thing and yeah. missing the others. Right. That's how I see it. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And so he makes this sort of mistake of blindness, right? And ends up um, having to go through with it. And, and the devil, I thought it was interesting. The, the, I should say for the listeners, in some versions of the story, it's a, the devil comes. In my particular telling, I just called him the gray man. There's a, right. quite a lot of German fairy tales where they talk about a gray man who's sort of mm-hmm. evil. So I just use that phrase. Um, Christianity was, this is a story which predates Christianity, I would say, in its, in its outlines, um, but it's just been added on to, you know, with Christian layers. But um, yeah, so then the cleanliness thing is interesting, right? Like the devil, the gray man is like, she's got to be clean or I have no power over her. What's up with that, Elaine? I don't know. What's going- well, okay. One thing that I wanted to say about making a deal with the devil, mm-hmm. okay? One way to look at that is that's when we stray away from our true selves. Mm-hmm. It's 
you know, I think we all have in us a kind of love and a way that connects to the greater world. That's the best way we can be. Mm -hmm. And sin and evil, there are just times where we really lose sight of that and begin to act from something really against our best nature. Mm -hmm. So that's how I look at the Miller. Yeah. And, um, and then the, so, you know, he has sold his daughter to this part of ourselves that is against love and the greater good of the world. And she refuses to be taken. Um, one way you could look at that is, well, yes, she cries at one point to wash her hands and it has to be uh, unclean. I, th I looked at that as just, she's not going to, who she is in that part of ourselves is not going to easily become something that we are not. Mm -hmm. Is that sound obscure enough? <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to become something. She's not going to go quietly and easily. No, no. Yeah. And that's, you know, it, in a way, she, it's, she doesn't have any special tools or anything other than her innocence. You know, mm -hmm. we all have parts of ourselves that no matter how we accomplished we are and all that we do out in the world, we have a part of ourselves that's very innocent and young mm -hmm. and pure, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and um, but she has a very strong character, actually, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, I, and what what it is that the you know, sin or what goes against the self can't go with something that's clean. I don't know. One could just think about um, those aspects of ourselves and how they remain uh, unique and separate. Because we all have times where we suddenly connect to that daughter, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We stop uh, focusing on everything and begin to say, write poems, mm -hmm. you know, or go hiking out in nature and just open ourselves up. And um, that uh, character is there. I don't know. Do you have any ideas on that? The crying and the tears? I, I'm just drawn to it because I love the fact that her sorrow uh, saves her in a way. Yes. You know? um, it makes the sorrow somehow... Uh, useful. I mean, we don't want to, you know, just make everything utilitarian, but still it's like she's she's just naturally scared, of course, and and sorrowful and that that saves her for a time, yes. which which I find really beautiful. Um, yes. Because there's a, not, kind of a voice. In, a, yeah, there's probably a voice in me which says something like being happy is the way to go all the time. And if you're being sorrowful, you're just kind of by the side of the road. You're not really a part of life, you know. But sorrow is, of course, part of life. And it's right in there with everything else. And the fact that her sorrow actually does something in the story to move it forward is, is very beautiful to me. Yes, in a way that is not taking a tool and chopping something or, mm -hmm. you know, it's really just using what she has, her tears, you know? Yeah. And I want to, you know, as we continue with the story, I did think about the difference between the handless maiden and depression, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. We all um, have periods where we cry and, um, you know, are consumed with grief, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. uh, but that's different than a deep depression where we do not move at all, you know. Mm -hmm. So anyways, so she does save herself. Yeah, she's not sort of inert. I mean, there's a sorrow, which is it's just getting somewhere. In, in the yes, story. yes. Yeah. Um, and so the devil comes three times and he fails in the end, has to let go of her. Um, and the deal's off in a way, kind of, but the damage is done, you know. Um, I kind of wondered, part of me was like, well, why does the devil not keep coming? I mean, uh, three times, what's, is there a rule somewhere? But, oh, but, but Jay, he surfaced, that, that devil or that aspect surfaces throughout the story. Yeah. It's just not over with, is it? <laughs> That's true. That's true. Yeah, yeah. He's not gone, you know. Yeah. Right. 
So it isn't so simple in the end. Yeah, it's yeah. true. It's true. Yeah. And then she hits the road and um Well, let's not let's not race past the t- part where she loses her hands. Okay? Oh, oh God. <laughs> I forgot. What's this story called anyway? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just blanked it out. It was so it was, That is a crucial detail in the story. Yes, it is. And you know, it's very violent and let's not mess around. It's violent, you know. Uh, but I think it is necessary in that it fits with this character mm-hmm. who is going through life without being so ego-centered and active, you know. She is courageous she, and she's a different kind of activity you know, mm-hmm. and, um, and so, you know, what I thought of as with her hands gone, she is forced into wandering in the most, um, well, in a particular way that she, a most inactive way, shall mm-hmm. we say. It's mm-hmm. very different to be in a forest and lost with all of your hands and your feet and whatnot. Mm-hmm. But in this story, this part of ourselves cannot hold on to anything, you know, mm-hmm. but sorrow, shall we say. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I did think about that. When are we like that, that we are so not about uh creating things with our hands or thinking things and out of our ego Mm -hmm. uh and i did think about prayer and meditation Mm -hmm. do you think that's uh, to an extreme connection (laughs) no no keep going (laughs) it's um i felt like when we stop our busy day and sit down and meditate or prayer prayer you know uh, that that's when we are letting go of all of these other things in our lives, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and, and just being, and I don't want to, um, pretend that all's great with this, uh, poor woman wandering without her hands, yeah. but there, it is good for us to consider when are the times that we don't have hands Mm-hmm. and are wandering uh, mm-hmm. in something greater than what we were in, you yeah. know? Yeah. And um, I, I don't know if meditation and prayer are a good thing, but I do know with prayer, we are often praying when we are, you know, desperate and, mm-hmm. uh, and we need to connect to something greater. And mm-hmm. I feel she is trying for that and had that initially because she would not go with the devil. She knows there is something greater, right? So the greater thing comes from, as you pointed out, she's not depressed. She's not like inert, like lying at home wrapped up. She does go out into the world, which is quite an important difference, you know, from just being completely depressed. Um, Yeah, I like what you say about prayer and meditation. It's... um, She's incapable of doing. She also has her hands, her arms bound behind her, yes. it seems. Um, yes. So it's pretty total, you know, Yeah. Um, almost animal like, you know, we talk about our opposable thumbs, you know, our hands. We're so great. We can make rocket ships and stuff and play right. the piano. But but she's just feet. And then, of course, uh, heart and soul and all that. But um, she's and- reduced. We can all think of ourselves too. When are we in that place where, where we are just unable to do anything other than wander, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And I think it's important to go back to the Miller and realize that if you want to be all these different parts of oneself, mm-hmm. we, each time we're so focused and busy and need to be that way, there is another aspect of ourself that is wandering and, mm-hmm. and not doing anything, you mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. and is trying to find another way to be in the world that is opposite of when we are so active. Yeah, you know? yeah. 
does she find that way or not? Um, before we leave this moment, that's not, I don't want to, yeah, we got to stay with the moment here. Yeah. Um, but I, I, this is just a question. I don't want to suck any life out of the story, but um, I don't know. Is it a story, is this story political in any sense that it's about women's disempowerment in particular? Or is that not really a, a, an issue? I mean, could it have been a, is it, does it matter that it's a handless maiden and not a handless prince, for example? What do you think? Um, I, I don't know as if it matters as much male or female, mm -hmm. uh, but I do think it is, as I said, very different having somebody wandering with all of their being versus somebody without their hands. There is something about this character that is as receptive as we can get, mm. as needy as we can get. And I think we all have to recognize what that is in us. Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, for somebody it may uh, mean that someone tried to take away their ability to be in the world and they relate to the story that way. Mm -hmm. uh, that's totally fine. Mm -hmm. Somebody else may be very successful and realize, oh, there is other parts of myself that are totally um, receptive, you mm -hmm. know, uh, totally without um, the ability to form anything. You yeah. know, yeah. Uh, so um, I don't, you know, I guess that's just up to the person whether they think it is mm -hmm. political. I myself think a little bit about our situation with COVID and the handless maiden, mm -hmm. uh, especially because we can't hug people like uh -huh. we used to. And, and we can't be, use our hands out in public. I was in the hardware store the other day and I made the mistake of opening up something and I was chastised because I'd used my hands, you know? Um, and there is something about COVID that makes us so aware of others as we walk, as we have to be, mm -hmm. and yet we can't touch them, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and we have to be so receptive because uh, we have to, go with whatever the government's saying in terms of what we should do, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on the COVID thing and the fairy tale, but... No, I just feel that the truth of what you're saying in a way, you know, we can't reach out and grab stuff, you know, out there. Other, you know, no. We don't shake hands, you know? Uh, that's uh -uh. just not happening. Yeah. And, you know, we can't go to our normal meetings where we meet people. I, I dance a great deal, so I can't go dancing very much because, I mean, so much of contact is now for, it's, it's dangerous, you know? Mm -hmm. So in a sense, it gives us a little bit of the feeling that the handless maiden has, yeah. I think, yeah. you know, as a culture. Right, yeah. right. That seems very true. You're making me just appreciate the joy of having hands, you know, <laughs> yes. like um, nailing siding on the back of a house in Vermont, you know, bam, yeah. bam, bam, you know, that type of activity is just so, right. um, so pleasant. Pleasant seems a little weak, but it's so um, vigorous and fulfilling, you know. Yes do something and accomplish it. I mean, I've spent a lot of um, time with music and with poetry and things like that, where you do use your hands, of course, but it's a little different, you know? I had a hand thing, I don't know. I, I, when I was in New York, I temped for office buildings and I typed all the time and my oh. hands would hurt uh, because I was writing poems at night and I was typing all day. Oh and um, yeah, I remember, house sitting in Vermont and this dog at this house would lick my hands all the time after I was oh. Oh. <laughs> somehow the dog knew I would finish writing in the I would write in the morning you know and I'd work on some poems hammering away at yeah. them and then I would be ready for like a walk and the dog would come in and just lick my hands all over um, wow. as if the dog knew somehow yes. You know, that yeah. this guy's trying to squeeze his heart and soul onto a piece of paper and his 
he's been typing too much, you know, or whatever. His hands are, are tired, you know, but, but. Well, um, and we would say, Jay, that then there is an aspect of you that was wandering without your hands during that time too. Yeah. And uh, I don't, because I think everybody should think about when they have felt like this um, and the opposite, because you are, in your images of using your hands so much, you're the opposite of the wandering. Uh, uh, but it goes together somehow, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it fits like two uh, hand and glove or what? That's the wrong. <laughs> no, that's not what I should have said, but it fits like two things, like puzzle pieces or something, you know. Well, I think it's ironic that you you needed your hands to create with, but your hands are really being used to earn a living and were yes. so tired. It was hard. So, you know, they were being worn out by that. Um, they were serving the miller, you know, they were working for the miller, you know. Yes. Yes. Instead of what I really wanted to do. Um, yeah. I, I should say here, just for the people listening to this show, I mean, a good, I hate to give out rules of thumb, but a, as, as we've been talking, it's occurred to me, you know, a, a great way into a story is to think what part of you is like a particular character. And, and we yeah. have these judgments, right? You might, you hear the story and it's good we have these judgments of, oh, this character is evil and this character is great and I love them and I hate them. And, but, um, I, from what you're saying, I'm reminded of that capacity for all of us to be the miller and to have this innocent part, you know, and and together those pieces make a, a whole, you know, a complete, yeah. a complete person, which is very right, which we need, you know. Yeah. Well, gosh, the handlessness. Yeah. Well, I wondered if this story was less um, spoke more to women in the 19th century than to people now, you know or women now but i don't know if that's a difficult that's just me getting mental maybe with it in in the sense that that um despite the inequalities that still persist women are more a part of the the doing of the world now than in the 19th century but i don't know it's that's a very complicated question um because it was yeah it's a very complicated question but this this story was making me think about that and, yes um, well again i think there's uh, even more opportunity now to be more like the Miller, shall mm. we say. Yeah. Um, but nobody, uh, no matter if you're male or female, you always have an opposite aspect mm -hmm. that is not in control mm. and is uh, going through life without controlling, you know, or avoiding. Avoiding is a kind of control. Um, and this person is really, uh, or this part of ourselves really knows God mm. and, uh, or whatever you associate with that term mm. and is really trying to find that, yeah. you know? And that is not something we do through our will. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in this story, the will stays home. You know, the Miller, he ends up remaining in that situation. I feel, I mean, of course, the story's called The Handless Maiden, and she is subjected to great brutality. But really, in the story as a whole, I feel bad for the poor Miller and his wife because they're, they're kind of unredeemed. They have to live with what has happened and yes. go on living with it. Whereas The Handless Maiden leaves, goes out the door, and has the potential to be healed, you know? Yeah. Um, well, perhaps we should leave that moment of the story and journey a little bit. So she leaves yeah. then, okay. and off yeah. she goes, wandering in the world. And then yeah. we get this image, which I've realized to me, I was thinking about it, the image of her in the pear, the garden with the pears. Yes. And um, to me, it's, I have to, realize that it's very it's actually very beautiful i hesitate to use that word or part of me doesn't want to use that word because it's so awful what has happened to her but it's kind of profoundly beautiful actually to have her in the garden eating these pears in the moonlight um, yes. do you have any thoughts about that part of the story well i thought it was interesting at least in the version that i read each pair was numbered mm. Mm -hmm. And so we have to realize she's wandering into a place that is very 
special. Mm -hmm. It is, and valued. Um, it's different than just wandering into some huge estate that the owner rarely even visits, mm -hmm. you know? These pears, for some reason, were very valuable to their owner. Mm -hmm. And so much so that each was numbered. Mm -hmm. And I believe one was taken a day. Um, they weren't just, you know, consumed. Um, so she's come into a space where nature's fruits, shall we say, are valued and special. Mm. Um, very different from where she came from, okay, from the miller. Right. Uh, who ground things up and processed them. So people, yes, could use them, but this is somebody who would be, who would know, uh, would not make a deal with the devil because he doesn't know about his peers, you know? His peers are a connection to God. That's how I look at it. And um, e even though, uh, you know, they're, they're just fruit, but uh, I think that's how she comes and joins them. And it's so beautiful to think of yourself with your hands tied behind, mm -hmm. reaching up to these, up, and these are amazing pears, like I said, mm -hmm. you know, and to be able to eat in that way, uh, what does that make you feel like? It's almost like we're a baby again. Yeah. <laughs> <And> <laughs> We're getting them for us, uh, uh, you know, or something. I don't know. It's a very interesting. You can imagine yourself doing this, you yeah. know, in the moonlight, as you said. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. yeah, it's it's very. It seems very early in life, as you say, like a baby or something like that. <gasps> it, it triggers some kind of thing in me, like that, you know. You know. Yes, and mm -hmm. those pears would be so juicy, and she is so hungry too, yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So I just think also, as we're imagining this aspect of ourselves that does not use our hands and is not in control, is outside of our ego, shall we say, um, what sustains this person, uh, this aspect of ourselves? Mm -hmm. How do we nurture that? How is that part nurtured? Mm -hmm. How do we find that beautiful garden? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not sure, but it's really a great thing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I love what you said about the, uh, the difference between the Miller's sort of world and the world of the pears and everything. Yes. Cared for. I think of, um, I think of like a factory farm where we're processing a thousand pairs a minute, you know, and the yeah. CEO of that, you know, um, yes. and I can feel it in my imagination and in my body, almost the, the distance between those two places, you know, right. it's, it's just great. And wow, it's a strong difference. You know. And even though she has gone through great sacrifice you know, being not using her will or her abilities in her hands and so forth. This fruit is, it's like, again, I'm going back to a spiritual reference, you know, it's like when you really hear God speak, you know, or the goddess speak, mm -hmm. um, when you do feel in tuned with grace. Mm. She is manifesting grace, in my opinion, eating these these pears, you know, mm. grace made real. And um, we can all think of to ourselves, when has this ever happened to us? Mm. It does happen to all of us, you know, mm -hmm. at some time where we really get in touch with grace. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. Anyways, that's, that's how I look at it. Yeah, well, she suffered. So, you know, she's had her hands cut off. And then she just wanders into this place where sweetness gives itself to her pretty right. readily um and yeah i think you're right i think of times when i was younger perhaps often that's i i connect that with with innocence and youth where you wander into something mm -hmm. and yes. you don't even realize how wonderful it is and then 10 20 years later it takes you forever to get back to that garden to that, right. that, that place whether it's right. in a relationship or um in some other way 
Um, perhaps it's the ease of inspiration, you know, when children are just inspired and they're like, oh, here, I wrote you a play, dad. I wrote you, I did five sculptures today, you know, and <laughs> yeah. then you get to be whatever, 35 or even 28. And it's like, you got all these ideas in your head. You got to struggle back to that simple inspiration and play, which you had right. as a child, you know. Um, and grace, grace is something that we do not will. You know, we don't control it. Um, we can find it, we can be in it, but it it's not, you don't get to grace by um, using your ego, shall we say, yeah. you know, or power. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So. It's not a labor. It's not a Puritan work labor thing. It, not at no. all. It just happens to you. In this particular story, there's other stories that activity does lead towards God. But in this story and this aspect that we're looking at, it really over and over brings out that it is not a thing about control. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it is really following and, um, you know, searching for something. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. While we're in the neighborhood here, yes. Elaine, um, yeah. <laughs> I think some of the folks hearing this, if they seek the story out, as we said, they're going to find different versions, uh, for example. Um, yes. I found a version from South Africa that I like a lot. Oh. And um, I'm told there's versions from South America as well. Um, but the one most people are going to run into, if you look this story up, you're going to find um, an angel and a devil, of course. You're going to find the deal with the devil and also an angel in the garden. Um, how do you feel about the angel, Elaine? Is it um, something tacked on later or is it intrinsic to the story? Or I do think it was tacked on later. Mm -hmm. uh, and I prefer to, as I said earlier, the whole devil thing to me is when we are not uh, following our true self, our greater self. Mm. And when we are in the company of the angel, we are getting closer to grace and true self or that, that aspect of us. And yes, we can't all run off and uh, be wandering around with our hands tied behind our back. <laughs> Although it works with COVID, we'd have to, how will we put our masks on? No, um, it's just that you, you know, you are these things simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And it's just the story reminds us, because we are so busy in life doing things, mm -hmm. that this other side that is connected to the greater god or nature or what is beyond us is there all the time you know mm -hmm. that that's how i see it yeah. yeah thank you for me the angel gets in the way a little bit i'm mean, the angel sort of beautiful but but i love the grace coming from the world itself you know from the pear trees from the grass in my backyard you know all these all the you know the air in the morning when you wake up the frost on that grass i mean these are all things in our world and it's as if the world has the a, a capability to provide grace within it, a, as well as to provide, you know, brutality and hardship, of course. But yes. so, so the angel in the story kind of like takes that energy away from the world and puts it in the hands of a Christian God, which kind of bugs me a little because I'd rather just have the, um, you know, the, the world itself be my be capable of. Yeah being my friend. Yes, and, and you know, the angel just is a connection to what is greater. You you know, you don't have to think Christian angel. Uh, yeah. For one thing, different cultures have a whole mess of different ideas about angels anyways. Some are not human at all. Yeah, so, that's helpful to remember. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cool, cool. Well, um, thank you so much for exploring this story. What else have we, uh, are there other things thoughts we haven't i mean it stories like this are pretty inexhaustible there's a lot of things in there you could hang around in it for a long time um other thoughts you have about the story well i just think as one is shall we say letting this story cook um uh it, you know this first half of it is to just think to yourself when when have I been ever like this, you know? And um, you, you know, some people may go more with when have I 
I had my hands tied behind my back, you know, when have I felt helpless? And that is one way to go. The other is to think about when have I not had my ego and control uh, directing me? Mm-hmm. When have I been letting go of that, really letting go of it, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, uh, and that, you know, you could think about those things a long time and see if there's any pattern in your life when this has happened. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and the contrast between what's when something's taken from you, as we could look at this story, you know, hands mm-hmm. being chopped off by a terrible father, and these things do happen. Uh, uh, or um, you don't have that feeling, you don't connect with that story that way, but more just when have I gotten in touch with a part of myself that is really receptive, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and uh, is not about my ego. And mm-hmm. um, when have I found God? you know, in this case, or those Mm -hmm. pairs, whatever those are, you know, for you, what are those pairs? They could be different things for everybody, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, that's very beautiful. And it's harsh to realize the Miller might be part of us as well, you know? Well, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, which, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, wonderful. Well, um, thank you so much for being with me and exploring this story. And um, we will be back um, with the rest of this story. It doesn't end here, actually, folks. Um, There is more. And that's, um, and that's actually kind of beautiful, too. I mean, that's almost a whole comment right there, that she gets to a place of grace, but she isn't, her story isn't over. You know, she still does not have her hands. And, um, There's a lot of healing ahead of her. But we're going to pause this journey here for the moment uh, in this episode of the Crane Bag Podcast and take it up in the next episode um, because we are diving deep into this story. Um, Thank you all for listening to this podcast. Uh, Thanks to the uh, Patreon supporters out there who helped to make this possible. If you're able to join them, that would be uh, lovely. There are over 30 hours of stories on my website, all there for free. And part of how that is financed is through the uh, generosity of folks able to uh, donate a little to the Patreon side of things. Uh, You can find all those links at my website, jleeming.com, J-A-Y-L-E-E-M-I-N-G. Dot com. Uh, be well, and uh, may we all enjoy the sweetness of the pears of this life. Take care.